story um, program on May the 10th. And actually our director is going to be giving the talk on this. It will be at the library. So I encourage you all to come. Um, we used to announce all kinds of programs when we did this program, but we have so many now. I recommend that you go onto the library website. If you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, for the next two programs, it is my great pleasure to be able to say that we're gonna be discussing some of the history, legacy and challenges facing the nations of New Jersey's indigenous people. And tonight is our great honor to have uh, Claire Garland, who is a descendant of the Lenape and Cherokee nations, um, who set up, her family settled about a mile west of Asbury Park, as far back as the 1600s. Those of you that know Claire know what an activist she has been. Uh, we could take the entire program to discuss her resume, but obviously we're not going to do that. Um, she is a very humble person, but I am here to tell you that she is an incredible New Jersey um, resident who is still doing amazing things for the state and the country. Um, next month, it is our great pleasure um, to be able to present uh, a special program on indigenous people in New Jersey with uh, Micheline Picaro and her husband, Chief Vincent Mann, who are with a, a clan of the Ramapo Lenape up in North Jersey. I don't know if any of you are aware of the mining, the Ford Motor Company. There's great controversy. They've done all kinds of things to protect their land and to uh, make their nation stronger. And so I ask you to please join us for our May 31st program, where again, we'll be presenting virtually at 7 p.m. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Patty White, who will tell you a little bit about Zoom etiquette and how we're gonna run the program tonight. Patty? Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> I know we're all experts at Zoom now, um, but just a gentle reminder, um, when you're not speaking, um, please keep your device on mute. If you accidentally are unmuted and there's noise coming from your device, we may mute you at this end. Um, we request that um, you save your questions and comments and input for our speaker till after her presentation. Um, if you want to put your comments in the chat or um, just ask to um, you know have a question and put it in the chat, or you can hit the um, raise hand uh, button on your screen. And um, we look forward to a wonderful presentation. Claire is going to introduce Claire. Claire Phelps will introduce Claire Garland. Thank you so much, Patty. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program this evening. And as you have heard from Linda, uh, our wonderful speaker tonight, Claire Garland, will be presenting tonight. She is the director of the Sand Hill Indian Historical Association, the New Jersey American Indian Affairs Commission resource person, and the New Jersey Historical Commission co-chair of Native History and Life. Um, she's won many awards, including the Monmouth County Education Association Friend of Education Award. She's got, she attended Rutgers University Graduate School of Education with a master's in sociological and philosophical foundations of education. And she is also the author of Indian Summer at Sand Hill, a and it was recently published by Rutgers Monmouth Interdisciplinary Journal just this past uh, January of 2023. So now for this evening, I'd like to present Claire Garland for our program tonight. Thank you, Claire. Thanks everybody. I'll try to pull up my screen and get started. So Claire, if you hit share screen. Okay.
We have somebody with us that is very technologically savvy. You're more than welcome to email me and let me know that you want to help us present this program virtually. There we go. You got it, Claire. Okay, good. Um, is it the full screen up or just partial? Um, uh, hit hit the slideshow uh, button and that should, okay. there we go, now it's perfect. Thank, Thank you me. everyone for joining us this evening. I'm glad to have the opportunity to share a few of my recent experiences and um, <clears throat> projects with you. Uh, should I admit this person that's on the screen or I don't have to do that? We'll take care of it. Okay. Um, it was my honor to participate in the second annual event of the Muncie Language and History Symposium held during the fall leaf moon on Luna Pahoking in October of last year, organized by Susan, Suzanne Akbari and her team from the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and the Princeton University Library and Archives. Okay, let's see if I can. Um, <clears throat> this was the gathering that was brought together, um, many from Wisconsin and Ontario, uh, families that traced their history back to New Jersey when they were forced to move a couple hundred years ago. This symposium brought together staff, students, faculty, and the public uh, into direct dialogue with members of the Muncie Delaware Nation to learn Muncie history, language, and culture. The speakers included the Muncie language keepers, historians, artists, and community members. This was the uh, cover of the program. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the inside of the program. And this was a language revitalization, counteracts the violent history of settler colonial regimes, including boarding schools, where native children were forced to speak English exclusively. It included land and language featuring Molly Miller, the turtle clan mother of the Mohican nation and the Stockbridge Muncie. Also Ian McCallum from the Muncie Delaware nation and the Ontario Institute for Studies in Toronto. Carell Hall from the Nanticoke nation and Rutgers University. Kristen Jacobs from the Nashville Ridge Elementary District. Another section included teaching and learning Lenape language, a timeline project, art and making. The artist and the museum included speakers for the University of Tennessee and people from the Manticoc, Montaquec, and Unicagunga nations. And excuse my pronunciation, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly and also Kala Ligon from the Sand Hill Navasink community. The section that I participated in was the history section, which included the archives roundtable, which included Suzanne Akbari, Melissa Moriton, Caitlin Rizzo from the Institute of Advanced Studies, and Faith, Faith Charlton from Princeton University Archives. Also, Anu Van Dantham from Princeton University Library, who is the li a liaison for the Indigenous Studies, and her two graduate students who are assisting in putting this collection together. Um, <clears throat> another section was on the special collections visit to the Firestone Library, where Gabriel Swift and Will Noel the librarian for special collections, presented the archival materials, which I'll be showing a few. Uh, the last day of the symposium was a trip to a seed farm in Princeton and uh, held conversations with Chief Vincent Mann and the clan mother, Michaeline Picaro from the Ramapo Nation that you'll be hearing from next month. 
Also, Tessa De Desmond from the Efren Center for the Study of America, Princeton University, and Sarah Vivit Rivet from the English and American Studies at Princeton University. Um, <clears throat> a map showing the uh, Lenape clans in our region included the Mincy, Muncie, and the North, the Yanami along the mid-coastal region, the middle of what we call New Jersey, and the disputed Unilatico in the lower Del Delaware. The dialects could be understood by other as they were part of the Algonquin language group. And I say disputed Unilatico because some scholars say they lived elsewhere, not in the southern part of New Jersey. But that would take a lot of research to um, check that out. Um, um, one of the participants with me was Rick Gethkin. Uh, we're shown here with the original deed of Tinton Falls, uh, which was settled in 1664. This deed was recorded in August 24th of 1674. Uh, the Lenape Sachem, Sachem names and their marks or signatures are written into the description of the land transaction to the Tinton Falls Iron Works in exchange for trade goods to John Bone, Boney, uh, Richard Hartshorn, and James Grover. The deed describes the land joining the Neversink River, the falls, the Pine Brook, the Hoxon Brook, and Swamp, and all other profits and goods, advantages and conveniences. It was signed and sealed at Middletown in uh, After Kill, which translate to, translates to Arthur Kill. The Allies at Neversink in the New Netherlands. Remember, at this time, this was not in New Jersey, this was New Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> tell you more about that in a little bit. This was the special collections um, part of the symposium, which was uh, which is handled by uh, Noel Williams and Gabriel Swift at the Firestone Library. Uh, on display were numerous items from uh, just one of a kind things that we were fortunate enough to see. A close up of the original deed, the Tinton Falls deed signed and sealed by Matapayas, Tawampong, Siponi, and John Boney, Richard Hartshorn, to Richard Hartshorn and James Grover for land in Toponymus and the date, August 24th, 1674. And it says in the deed, it consists of land, the land of Wamaramanong, which we call Tintin Falls. It was entered into the records into the province of New Jersey, eventually by James Bolin on March the 1st, 16. 77. And just a little bit of trivia, there are there are 800 deeds in the archives at the State Department in New Jersey, in Trenton. Just in case you want to read some of them, look them up. Uh, this was one of the items. <clears throat> this was a 1746 um, notebook by the Presbyterian missionary David Brainerd who recorded uh, Lenape phonetics and word meanings, trying to understand the sounds and what those sounds meant. And the diary from 1761 of his brother, John Brainerd, uh, <clears throat> who lived 1720 to 1781, during his time as a missionary at Brotherton Reservation, New Jersey, which is near Medford Lakes, and it's also part of the um, catalog.princeton.edu. You can find it in their library system just by going online. Um, <clears throat> this is an early map that Rick put together um, <clears throat> of, um, we've been doing 
these uh, just areas in Monmouth County up here at the shore first. Rick is uh, way of, ahead of uh, the rest of us, but he's able to take the language in the deed and then find the boundaries um, <clears throat> for that property. This is an early map of what we know of as the Navasink and Shrewsbury Rivers, showing their original names, Aramungnen and Kapatungmung, and also I highlighted the falls at the water, the, the, the Tintin Falls. Uh, this book by Joseph Grabus, Owning New Jersey, I always recommend because he was a title researcher, still is. In fact, he just did a talk somewhere. And um, he's just such an excellent researcher of land records. And <clears throat> this information goes all the way back to the very beginning of settlement here. And um, what a what a speaker he is! What a researcher! So I, I advise everyone who's interested in land transactions to start here. Um, one of the earliest maps. This is a 1685 map of New Amsterdam, and what's interesting about it um, is it has one of the first spellings of the word Connecticut. Uh, I think it might be cut off um, a little bit under my picture, but <clears throat> Connecticut, Massachusetts were tribes, were nations of people. And then some of the other names that are, are still there, Matavacans, we know as Matawan, of course, Manhattans, Tappans, Mata, Matawak, uh, Montauk, Poughkeepsie, tux Tuxedo. I mean, you could, I, I did a talk at um, <clears throat> Middletown Historical one night, uh, just the whole 45 minutes was just about names and places and the meanings of those. So um, this is a trail marker called the Indian Trail from the Delaware at Minisink to the sea at Navasink. Pass through this ravine along the Raritan uh, River near New Brunswick and um, also had a German, a Hessian encampment there, but um, I just thought it was interesting that they would mark the Menacing Trail coming from the Delaware Water Gap all the way down through the Wachung Mountains across to um, Middletown and right here to Navasink. Uh, this is another one of um, Rick's um, outlines of Tintin Falls. And you can see the uh, back of the swimming river. And then the, the boundaries included what we know of as Brookdale College, uh, the back end of a swimming river, Colts Neck. It mentions Yellow Brook. It mentions Hot Brook, which is in Homedale. And uh, acres were added as, as the years went by and the settlers started buying more and more acres. Um, <clears throat> this is a recent marker in Tintin Falls, right at uh, Biff Falls, um, a marker for the ironworks at Tintin Falls acknowledges the land purchased from the Lenape Native Americans, bought by James Grover for the establishment of one of the first ironworks in New Jersey. It was an important um, facility used in making utensils, pots and pans and bullets, and uh, also served a, as a courthouse and a post office. And just a little bit about uh, Lewis Morris, who was also owner of this property eventually, in 1675, purchased half of that business and then renamed it as Tintin Manor, which was named after Tintern Abbey in Monmouthshire, Wales. So our history goes all the way back to Shrewsbury in England, Monmouth, um, and you'll you'll find so many of the names that we have here go right back to England. Um, <clears throat> Lewis Morris, there were six or seven Lewis Morrises, so you have to use the date to know which one you're talking about. Um, he he imported about eighty enslaved people from Barbados, uh, and it created the largest African population here in what was called East Jersey. 
a death report mentions an African cemetery on the rear of the Crawford House property, which is now uh, owned by the um, Tinton Falls Historical Society. Um, the falls was the highest natural falls uh, along the coast of the um, United States. It had a drop of 19 feet. Uh, the Tintin Formation is, is a hardened iron cement sandstone with a thickness of 22 feet and dates back uh, 120 million years. The falls furnished power for early industry, an iron forge, a grist mill, a fueling mill, and there was a distillery next to the falls. Also on this property was the 17th century home of Governor Lewis Morris from Barbados. This governor died in 1691. There were several after that. They were all related. Morris County, um, Morris Town, got lots of Morrises around. Uh, the Morris Mansion served as a, a county justice of the peace. He also served Different ones served as a Supreme Court Justice in Monmouth County. One served as the first colonial governor of New Jersey, died as governor in 1746, and um, eventually ended up purchasing almost 6,000 acres of land in Monmouth County. Oops. I think I've lost my uh Is there something can you see that? Yes. Yeah, we got the map. Thank yeah, you. it's good. Okay. There's something on my screen. I can't get it off, but I'll just. Um, okay, um, this is a map of the southern um, <clears throat> area of Tinton Falls that included Ravy Town, where the Ravy family owned 105 acres along Shafto Road. It bordered on the Ravy branch of the Shark River. The property was eventually taken by eminent domain by the Board of Freeholders and made into the Monmouth County Recycling Center. I've lost my cursor. Okay. See that? Yeah. Okay, there's something on my screen that I can't get off, but anyhow. Well, we can't see it. We see the, your screen, uh, Hidden History. Yep. Okay, good. All right. This is a book by Rick Gefkin, which also includes facts and um, information about the early settlers in the towns around the area, including the Sand Hill community. Um, <clears throat> this was a, a 1949 zoning map of Shrewsbury and Tinton Falls showing the area where Ravy Town uh, was um, existed along Shafto Road. This is a sign marker of the Road to Shark River, which is mentioned in so many deeds. It's been cut off to, there's only about 200 feet of it now. Uh, it's off of Hope Road. It's near Shafto Road, it's, but it's been cut off by Route 35, being cut through, and also Route 18, and local housing developments. But if you were looking for this road, which is mentioned in so many deeds on the road to Shark River, you would have a very difficult time finding it. So markers are important. And <clears throat> just a few Lenape words that are still with us that were recorded in deeds as places and tribal nations, geographic descriptions, uh, such as Navasink and Whippany, Weehawk and Hoboken, Wanamassa, Tuckahoe, Teanuck, Secaucus, Rancocas, Rawway, Piscataway, Peepak, Paramus, Matitaconk, 
uh, Manasquan, Manalapin, Manaloking, Hackensack, Absecon, Cinnaminson. And, you know, I spoke <clears throat> at a synagogue uh, a couple of months ago, and it occurred to me that as I was listening to the prayers, I was listening to the rabbi and people read and speak their language from 5,000 years ago. It occurred to me that what a miracle that is that they were able to save their ancient tongue and still use it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this was a project um, that I worked with, with uh, Kay Harris and the Asbury Park Historical Society included information about the Sandhill clan in their uh, exhibit that was at the Asbury Park Library. Uh, Restelle Richardson Reavy married Johnson, B. Benjamin Reavy. Um, she was listed in Monmouth County's 400 year um, history of Monmouth County women as a craftsperson and a person of um, uh, such a community activist. And they did a, a write up of the um, housing and the, the building that the family did in Asbury Park. And um, they were leaders of their community. So it was nice to be honored in, uh, with the Historical Society. Um, I put a few things in the exhibit, handmade items um, <clears throat> made by the family, photos, moccasins, um, headband, um, a turkey feather fan, not too many because um, space was limited. And here in Middletown, um, there are several Lenape markers along Kings Highway to honor the Sachem Pampamora, who was the um, a person who saved Penelope Stout at least twice, once uh, from dying after her uh, ship had gotten um, hit by a sandbar or something. And they were attacked and she was injured and her husband died and he took her back to the village and nursed her back to health and Anyhow, got her back to New Amsterdam. She married uh, Richard Stout, moved back here to Middletown, bought property, and he warned her again that they were going to be attacked, and she was able to get her kids out and escape. So Middletown has honored uh, Pompamora on their uh, street signs on Kings Highway and some other places. And one sign is for the Lenape Trail that Kings Highway was. Um, widened from that trail and made into the King's Highway. And the other are just street signs that have the figure head of uh, Pompamora uh, rep uh, representing the Navasink people. Uh, this sign was um, done in collaboration with the Intertribal Council of AT&T employees and other community groups. And Mark um, got uh, uh, sorry, I forgot his last name, but he was very instrumental in um, getting three of these markers um, installed. Two have been installed. One is at the AT&T building on Laurel Avenue, and the other one is on Kings Highway near the municipal complex, um, right near the Presbyterian Cemetery. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, it says the uh, the menacing trail comes from the council fire at uh, at the Delaware um, water gap down through across New Jersey, comes down through Holmdale, Middletown, and on to Navasink. So that's quite an honor to have um, Middletown and at and and community groups place these markers around, which makes um, makes it for sure that it'll be remembered as uh, having historic value. Uh, Mark is in the process now of um, uh, finding a location for the third marker near the riverfront or ocean front somewhere. And of course, Red Bank had a, a known Lenape village right at Oyster Point on the river. And there was a 30 foot long midden recorded there. And of course, we've got the hotel now, Oyster Point. So Red Bank also goes back um, into the historical records. This is grandmother's cousin, Christina Richardson Dickerson, 
wearing a, a deerskin dress, <clears throat> which had been donated to the Neptune Historical Museum decades ago, till they closed about uh, 2000, and we petitioned to get all of our things back and returned. This is the Ravy Marker, which is at the White Ridge Cemetery in Eaton Town. The family owned property that was under what we would call Eaton Town Circle and uh, Monmouth Mall. Uh, they owned property that where the uh, UPS building is now on Hope Road. And of course, all down through Shafto Road. Um, the tax records go back to 1780 in Shrewsbury, uh, <clears throat> maybe even before that, but that's the earliest I was able to find. These markers are my grandmother's great-grandparents, uh, Richard Ravy and Susan Van Surley from Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> goes back to, uh, they were born in the uh, 1780s and the markers say uh, 18, 66 for her and 1868 for him. They're buried in the Indian burial ground off of Squangum Road in Tinton Falls. This is uh, Mayor Anthony Perry of Middletown proclaiming every November, November as Native American Heritage Month. And um, the proclamation gives a little bit of background information about the original settlers. Uh, uh, in the land, which was sold uh, by the Navasink people in 1662. Some settlers learned the language of Lenape people and uh, trying to phonetically spell out what they thought they heard. Niwa Inc. Navasink, somehow they got that. Uh, the land was called Chiquasic. And um, of course, we know it as Middletown. Um, it, uh, they also mentioned the, um, beach plums, um, sorry, um, the beach plums on Sandy Hook and the town that was laid out along the Indian path with homes on each side. Of course, we know that Indian path today as King's Highway. Uh, this is a Lenape marker, um, designer Judy Abbott from the Deer Clan of the Ramapo Lenape Nation. Um, so far, they, her group has developed five markers that honor the Lenape heritage and the continued presence on the land and includes the Muncie Lenape text. Working with saved native sites, is uh, the goal is to share knowledge and and recognition of indigenous people using Paths Through History program. Uh, one marker has been installed in Canada, another one at the Catskill Interpretive Center at, in uh, Mount Tremper, New York. Uh, one is to be installed at Mawa, New Jersey this spring. Another at the Matthew Pearson House a Museum and Cultural Center in Kingston, New York. And we're hoping to get one here at the shore in Monmouth County somewhere, maybe Tinton Falls or Red Bank. And our um, my favorite museum, of course, is the Smithsonian on the mall right next to the Air and Space Museum. If you go, you can't miss it. And um, uh, also one in New York, downtown at Bowling Green. And I'd also like to recommend the New Jersey Historical Commission YouTube channel. Um, uh, last year, the year before we uh, did three days of programming, panel discussions, lectures, which are all recorded and on their YouTube channel. So for further information, um, please uh, check out New Jersey Historical Commission. YouTube channel. Also, the American Indian Commission website has information. And um, once you start looking, you'll find a lot of things. Thank you very much. I'd be glad to um, join with the discussion. If I can get this off my screen, I'll be glad to join you. <laughs> Just hit stop share. 
my cursor has disappeared. So I don't know what to do. I, I can stop it for you. Okay. There we go. You're good. Can you? Good. I still have something on my screen. Well, we don't have it anymore, Claire. Okay, that's good. So it's all good. <laughs> um, Sorry about have, that. No, it's all good. Um, I think Rick Gefkin is with us tonight. Rick, do you oh, have anything good. to add to this? Uh, I, I couldn't for a second add anything. Claire did an excellent job, but thank you for thinking of me. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the information is, is phenomenal. And it just piques my interest just to, to do more exploring um, about this wonderful topic uh, and just the history. The history, I live in Matawan and like, so from Matawan all the way down into Red Bank, into Tinton Falls and all of that, all through Middletown, Holmdale, so much history. Yes, right. And this is Kay, I wanna say thank you so much too. I thought I knew it all. <laughs> and every time I hear Claire speak, I'm learning something new. So thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's good. Claire, is it true that um, through the Sand Hill Indian History Association that that's the state's only online database offering documents and records and things? The New Jersey there, Historical Commission? Yeah, uh, I had something that through the Sand Hill Indian History Association, it's the state's only online database. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. I don't know where that would come from it's definitely not the only one mm -hmm. is Monmouth County particularly rich in indigenous communities or I mean next month we're going to talk about up in North Jersey and Sussex I'd say, and I'd say yes the whole state actually but Monmouth in particular because they kind of came here first, 1660s, that's pretty early. And of course, North Jersey with the uh, Dutch settling and buying up uh, Bergen and, and um, that area first across mm. the river and then eventually branching down here because they were being kind of persecuted by the Dutch in, um, in uh, New Amsterdam because <clears throat> they kept breaking the rules and they were Quakers. Mm -hmm. They had a different set of um, guidelines that they lived by. So they had to get out, and that's why they came. To Monmouth so, County. Yeah, but that's, oh, a, okay. that's another whole interesting talk. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Discrimination. Right. Well, somewhat, Patty's posed a question. Um, can you talk about the language project? The one thing I want to say, though, is... Um, I grew up playing in a park called Unami Playground, Unami Park. And when I saw that name on the map, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that name goes back to the very beginning. I would like to try to get this off my screen if possible. I hope I don't get disconnected, but I'm gonna try it. Okay. Claire, can you talk a little bit about the language, the language project? project. Um, well, um, the um, the only thing I can say is I I th this uh, symposium uh, with Susan Akbari and the Princeton people, they are actually writing and. Um, putting real language on the paper and trying to get the sounds. That's why sometimes you see the double A's and trying to get that sound that we would probably call in English a schwa sound, mm -hmm. trying to get the phonetic sounds of the word. And the people in Wisconsin and Ontario still have some of the language. Some of that still remains. They remember um, some of the sound. I don't, all I can do is you know, I can do a talk on names and places just based on research material, 
Um, but um, they are actually trying to put books together, uh, books for elementary students, trying to teach the language, trying to speak. Um, and of course, the, the markers are a way of remembering the language that was here. The name Muncie, is that um, a name up in for Canada, up in North America, that area, or is that uh, that's, New Jersey? Or? That's the, um, the language, Muncie. Okay. I mean, even the name Canada, Canada right. is, and Kentuck, Kentucky, and Chicago, right. and right. Um, Milwaukee, Tallahassee, and um, um, Mamaroneck, and I mean, you can, Mississippi, I mean, you could go on and on for days and weeks. So we're already speaking the language. <laughs> right. We could use it every day in foods and animals and uh, places and things and um, Secaucus Station. And mm -hmm. uh, we use it every day and we don't even realize we're speaking the language because we've just absorbed it into American English. That's so interesting. And they recorded the um, these names in the deeds because they wanted that if, if there was a question in years gone by, they wanted to be able to say, well, this these were the people we bought this land from and this is what we paid. And these deeds are interesting because they list what they paid. They paid 95 of this, 100 of that, 10 coats, nine guns three barrels of uh, powder. Um, you know, it's interesting to see what they traded, uh, materials and clothing and cloth and guns and talk about guns. Guns have been traded since the very beginning of time. Right, right. right. So many guns and, and other, other goods. And that's where a lot of the, I guess, our early trading and, and business and commerce began. Right. Right. We have two thank yous, one from Stacy and Tracy Buckley. Very informative, thank you. And Christine Bonacco has a question. Did a significant number of Lenape move to Wisconsin and do they have a settlement there? Yes, they do. Um, I'm not ex exactly sure where it is, but uh, there were people at the conference that had flown here and visited the um, National Museum first and then came up to Princeton. Uh, the Stockbridge Muncie are, are there somewhere out there and also another group in uh, Toronto and Ontario. And actually the Richardson people, my grandmother's family, <clears throat> they, they were on their way to Canada. They stopped here and um, stayed with their Reavy cousins and never got beyond New Jersey, but they were headed to Canada because that's who the treaties were with, the British. Mm -hmm. The Cherokee had treaties with the British and, you know, they had deals. They, they had diplomatic relations with the, um, with the British. And what's so interesting, I found a newspaper article from a London Gazette paper from 1762 or 63. Wow. And a picture of, um, four Indian chief diplomats that had gone to England on the boat. And they were over there for several months dealing with King George because that's who their treaties were with. Mm -hmm. and of course, they came back with what we know mm -hmm. of as proclamation mm -hmm. of, of 1763. And of course, that blew up the whole world. So, <laughs> wow. so much for that diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> so much history. Excuse me, Claire. Um, yeah. Jim has a question as well. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, you mentioned earlier there was a, a kind of oyster point in Red Bank. They, mm -hmm. There was a, a settlement, a midden, which I believe, if I remember correctly, is where people would discard things. Shells. They just they oh, they okay. put their they shells a shell deposit. And, yeah. Okay. yeah, in a pile. And this particular midden was recorded to be like 30 feet long by 15 feet wide. So it was pretty big. There, there are several left too. Now, most of these were um, just, just ripped up and, and put on the dirt roads to make the roads firmer. Sure. But there's some left in upstate 
New York and Connecticut, uh, probably not in New Jersey because you know we're we're a small state and every inch is needed somewhere. Mm -hmm. But there was Actually, I've a seen at Oyster. I've seen one in. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a midden recorded at Oyster Point. And how long ago was it recorded? How long was the archaeo How long ago was the archaeological work done? I would have to look it up, <clears throat> as I couldn't trust my. Uh, <laughs> no, just dates. curious. I saw. I I actually saw a midden up in uh, Maine. Yeah. Uh, they in fact they used to actually mine the oyster shells and grind them up for uh, for fertilizer for lime. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Interesting. Mark Gottworth has a, a question. Are the Muncie and then wolf in parentheses and Unami with turtle in parentheses clan groups? Are they clan groups or linguistic langu language groups or both? I think they were more clan groups, but they spoke a similar language dialect they could understand each other from what i when from what i hear kind of like us and say a southerner we can understand them and they can understand us but some of the words are a little you know right away if, if someone from boston is talking you know right away they're from boston or if somebody from alabama is talking you know right away they're a southerner just because of the way the the some of the words are spoken and pronounced. And when I went to Texas, they told me I talked funny. <laughs> so <clears throat> I thought the same about them. Interesting. And Christine has another question going back to the Oyster Point. Uh, where did the artifacts from the Oyster Point dig and up? She thinks it was about 15 years ago. That I don't have any information about. I would have to research that to find out. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I know is that the middens were kind of just taken away and um, made into, uh, they tried to make the, the paths and the roads for their wagons. Uh, the dirt roads were just impossible uh, to make any progress or to, I mean, they even tried to use logs to put down to roll their mm. wagons on and the middens were used as a kind of a material and from what I understand it was just bones and shells and uh, discarded items kind of like we would throw away so I don't know if anything would have been saved from it okay I'm not familiar with that term you're saying middens or middens m-i-d-d-e-n Oh, M I D D E N. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll look that up. Okay. What does that mean, Claire? Midden. I guess it was just the uh, Lenape word for, um, you know, recycling or trash pile or something. Okay. And as you said, they took those materials and used them in other ways. Right. That they could, like we do now. Right. Mm -hmm. So Claire, this might be a silly question, but in promoting your program, I had the spelling L-E-N-A-P-E, but in working on Chief Man and Mikaline Picaro's program for the Ramapo Lenape Turtle Clan, I have L-U-N-A-A-P-E. Yeah. What is the difference? Well, I think one is uh, the phonetic spelling of Lenape trying to get the sound in Muncie uh -huh. to come out um, because, you know, a lot of this, um, a lot of the early names were kind of uh, written down by the Dutch. So they were trying to write down what they heard, what they thought mm. they heard. And then, of course, the English took over and tried to write down what they thought they heard from the Dutch. Um, and then you've got names like uh, Sag, Sagaponic for Sag Harbor. Mm. So they should just drop off half of it, like um, Hackensacky. And so many of words had uh, syllables connected to them, which the English said, we don't have time for this. Chop. And 
they got it down to um, a word that they recognized as Sag Harbor or Matawan or Wanamasa or whatever it is. So what would be correct now? Which spelling? Is there one preferred over the other? No, I don't think so. It's it's all more or less in a state of evolution. Mm -hmm. And as they get more sounds for and more words together, um, you know, I, I, I might be able to get it standardized, but I think it's in the, in the beginning processes of just being uh, trying to get the sounds and the words down as best they can. Huh, I see. I see Lenny Lenape together. Um, well, let me. Lenny is a word that doesn't seem to show up in the historical record. So uh, scholars aren't sure um, where it came from or why people use it, but you, you see it. Okay. And I usually just use Lenape. Okay. That's, that's what you see in the historical records. Okay. Lenny, Lenny just kind of shows up as time goes by, but I don't know if there's any historical background to the word so and I actually thought that that was the more formal way or the more correct way of referring um but as you said maybe it, it might have been part of a longer name or something and it was cut I'm not sure yeah, yeah. something to research um we we do have in the chat also that midden is an archaeological term for a refuse thrown out. Okay. And I think Al has his hand up. Okay. Al James. Yes, Al, you had a question? Yes, I just wanted um, to ask Claire. She had mentioned, <clears throat> it sounded like she mentioned that the um, native groups were driven out of uh, New Jersey. And I wanted to know whether that was something formal or just an unfriendly app, unfriendly environment created that? Well, uh, you know, there, there were allies of different groups. The Dutch had allies, the English had allies, the French had allies, the Spanish had allies. Different Indian groups were allied against other Indian groups. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like one, there was one monolithic group. I mean, it, it, just like Europeans, if I say European and ask you what you think, when I say that word, you might come up with French or Spanish or English or Russian or German or Basque or Italian or Hungarian. I mean, there's, they're European groups, but they're individual um, parts of European so Native Americans were the same way. You say Native American, you're talking about hundreds of different groups, just like the French or the Germans, who speak a different language, have different customs and cultures and traditions, and can't necessarily speak to each other. Um, <clears throat> so people um, say Native American, and they kind of lump everybody into the same um, category. But they're different categories, and they weren't all. Some of them were Christian, some of them weren't. Mm. And that caused a big, um, you know, riff in um, tribes. They they all didn't get along. They all don't get along today. So, um, the Lenape people here, some of them had uh, treaties with the colonists. Some of them were allied against other groups, and. Um, if they had a, an agreement um, with a group and got along, that's probably how the, uh, this Sand Hill group got to stay or chose to stay on the property. And of course, military people were paid in land. So mm. even George Washington expected to be paid in, in property and ended up, um, getting thousands of acres in the West and, you know, so don't quite know why some of the groups stayed, but there were little pockets of groups of people all around the area that stayed. And um, some left, some chose to leave. They didn't, they didn't like the system. 
Mm -hmm. They didn't want anything to do with the people. They, they wanted their own space, their own way of living. And they chose to leave, just as um, the Richardsons chose to leave uh, northern Georgia and move, because they, they probably um, had, to, had to go. But um, if you didn't have a choice, or if you had a choice, some people chose to stay. Yeah, I was uh, trying to, you know, I guess, I guess when Andrew Jackson was president and I guess it was all sort of became a policy that that uh, Native Americans. Uh, yeah, that was in the like 1830s and all that. Um, my grandmother's people had left by then. They they started showing up on censuses here about 1800 and 1810. Mm -hmm. So they had already left and migrated. As you know, the, the um, settlers were, were continuing to push westward for, for decades. They were right along the eastern seaboard, and then they started pushing across the Appalachians mm -hmm. and going west, following the rivers and pushing west, and buying up property. So it's just a, it was a gradual process that happened over a long period of time. And people move now because... Mm -hmm. Uh, for one reason or another, too expensive, too crowded, don't like it here anymore, no more farms, whatever. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they move on. So that's what happens. That's true. Well, Claire, you mentioned, um, showed us a slide of your grand, was it your grandparents, great grandparents? Right. Okay. And um, so your lineage goes all the way back to the Reeves and yeah, the, um, the um, yeah. I was fortunate enough to um, hear stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in, in those days, people actually sat on a front porch and talked at night, and um, listening to stories about how the family had a farm in Manhattan, mm -hmm. Van Surly family, and uh, I I couldn't really find it. All I knew was that um, the land they had had been purchased by the American Express uh, company because they wanted to um, bring their horses and they wanted to set up an office in um, lower Manhattan. And they happened to buy the Van Surly property. Okay. And um, Rick Gaffigan found it. He found a death uh, record, which had the uh, family, the Van Surly family, uh -huh. It's my grandmother's uh, great grand people and the property and the address. And um, when, when I look it up on a map now, it's um, as the years went by, it was also taken when the Holland Tunnel was built because they needed the, the uh, space for the automobile, something new, <laughs> oh, <laughs> not boy. just wagons, but cars. And um, so the um, the property is kind of, you know, it's all paved over now, but mm -hmm. Late Street is still there and it's a very expensive area. Right, right. Uh, right off of Canal Street. But it, it was mm -hmm. just interesting. I never thought I would know where that farm was. And the thought of having a farm in Manhattan of the 1840s, of course, you think of Manhattan today. And right. you probably can't find anything living other than a rat, <laughs> but um, a farm in Manhattan. I was always intrigued by that. But uh, that's who's buried at the uh, off of Squonkum Road in the cemetery called Shadow Rest. Okay. Back, back there behind um, the uh, church, the A the AME church is back there also. Is that in Tinton Falls or Eaton? Tinton Falls. Tinton Falls. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's so. It's got to be so exciting to to have that information about your family. Yeah. And to think of New York having farms. I mean, I've seen some pictures of it years ago before it looks like what it looks like now. But you know, to know that your family history is there. Very very interesting. We have another question from let's see patty has a raised hand yeah. patty you have your hand raised uh, yeah but christine binocco yeah. had a question before me 
Right, I saw that here. Um, she says, am I correct that the Lenape were part of the Delaware Nation and so were the Ramapo? Well, Delaware is a word that kind of covered um, you know, many areas. It was a word that came from a governor whose name was Delaware. Okay. And because he was in charge of the tribal people in the area, they became known as the Delaware Indians. But the word Delaware doesn't have any um, derivative back to Muncie language. It's it's a English or French word. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's used, but um, the root of the word really is European. Delaware, right. That was the name of the, the, the person, governor. the governor. Okay, right. And they, I guess it must have been two names and then they maybe put it together as one right. word. Right. I think it was three names. I had three, Delaware. Delaware. <laughs> okay. Possibly. Right, right. Interesting. Sue Goldberg uh, has given us information that if anybody, if anyone wants to read more about middens, um, though none of these are listed as in Red Bank, uh, she's posted some links in the chat. Okay. A couple of links from Atlas Obscura and uh, the New York Times. And Rick Gefkin's article in Two River Times um, is citing you, Claire. Um, uh, the lasting Lenape legacy on the Navasink. And so that's some more information. And um, thank you, Rick. <laughs> there are two other, two other links as well, oyster shells and something else uh, near Tuckerton, New Jersey. Information about that. Another Indian name, Tuckerton. Tuckerton, right, right, right. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, yeah, I, I do have a question for you, Claire. Um, I'm really curious about, um, so you did say there was some uh, Lenape people out in Wisconsin who came to the conference. I guess what I'm wondering is, um, are there, if there's, well, are there any uh, native speakers still who either speak some Lenape or is there a, a closely related sister language that um, is helping the linguists kind of put together the pronunciation? Um, yes, there are speakers um, mm -hmm. who are trying to save as much as they can. And um, I think they have quite a bit recorded and they're trying to phonetically write it now and mm -hmm. get it down before it's totally lost. Right, there, thank you. There yeah, are that was my question. That, um, Ian McCallum from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Toronto, mm -hmm. he speaks it and reads it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there, there are more people that I'm you know, not aware of, but at the conference, they were all involved in some way of preserving the culture. Okay. Claire, um, may I just say something? Uh, the next program that we, we have um, is gonna talk a lot about discrimination and things that are going on environmentally and culturally with the uh, Lenape Turtle Clan. Um, I, I don't know how many people that are with us tonight are um, know about what's been going on with the Ramapo Nation. They've been dealing with the consequences of toxic dumping in their land in Ringwood by the Ford Motor Company. This has been going on for years. And um, both Chief Mann and uh, Micheline Picaro are advocates for the environment and issues. And they're gonna be discussing, you know, um, prejudice as far as education, as far as environmentally, and um, emotional issues that have greatly affected their people. 
and people dying as a result of polluted water. We've talked about environmental issues, racism affecting environmental issues, um, but that will be discussed um, in great detail. Um, they, they're, they've worked on a farm in Sussex County um, called the Three Sisters Medicinal Farm, but um, you know we have not really talked previously about environment as far as issues go facing indigenous people in New Jersey. Is there anything you can add to that, Claire, as far as Monmouth County goes? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I remember talking a little bit last year about environmental racism. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and, you know, we've got these sites around, uh, even the Reclamation Center in Tinton Falls, you know, they've had lots of problems with that. Hmm. Of course, the uh, town fathers, Monmouth County or whoever, whoever owned it, got rid of it, sold it to private uh, industry because they were sick of dealing with it. Yeah. So, you know, these environmental problems um, affect everybody. and. Yeah. Um, especially this close to this many people and to Shark River watershed. And, um, but where nobody wants it, nobody wants it in their backyard, so. Actually, um, Claire, I just put something in the chat about the documentary that HBO ran about, um, about this dumping and, and the case Man v. Ford that um, explains the whole big thing. So this documentary was made in um, 2000 and, oh gosh, I can't remember, uh, 2010, 2010. Uh, it's an HBO documentary. Um, any of you who, I mean, I, I invite people who wanna uh, join the next program to watch this ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll have a greater appreciation for um, what the presenters have to say. It's its shocking and terrifying and very eye-opening. Yeah. And I think that the a part of the talk I gave was about the environmental damage it does to newborn and right. the developing yeah. um, fetus. And, that, right? um, you know, the damage is done before the child is even born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's what's... Um, just so devastating about it. Mm -hmm. Well, with the, the Ford Motor Company, I think they reached a $21 million settlement in 2019, but they're still dumping up in North Jersey. So it hasn't stopped. No. Um, it's still continuing. Linda, isn't there also some, um, some that footage, but a, a few clips on YouTube because I think oh yeah if we you, had um, another program with that yeah there is a lot of information I about a year ago uh, we had talked with Chief Man about actually doing a program at that time and it became a very big news article I think it was a year ago and uh, so that you you can find a lot of YouTube's on it a lot of information on it. Uh, Steve um, Abogado, is that his name, I think, did a program with Chief Man about it, but it's ongoing. Oh, right. Steve Adubadu, he's a, an attorney and a New Jersey um, commentator. Jersey. I think he's at, yeah, he's at, right. I mean, if, if you just Google Chief mm -hmm. Man or put in Micheline's name, you'll find a lot of interesting articles and you know, coverage was done extensively about what they're going through up in North Jersey, but it hasn't stopped. No. Uh, the land has been poisoned and, uh, you know, they're dealing with the after effects of all this. I believe it affected 4 million people. Yeah. Could have been more actually, but, you know, they're, they're certainly advocates for a clean environment and they're, they're doing everything they can to make the land more usable, but they were forced off their land. 
Mm. And that's in recent years. We're not talking 200 years ago. Hmm. And I'm sure there are probably other places in the country or maybe even in the state where the same thing is happening. Um, that's unfortunate. That would be like a, a new, another movement. I mean, I know that it's been a movement and there's been a lot of activism, but there seems to be focus on other things now where well, this is I, happening in our country, so. And when it comes to indigenous people, right. so many people were quiet. They didn't even want to admit that, you know, they were Native Americans. It was more of a secret, isn't that correct, Claire? Yes, yes, that's, it was something that uh, people just kind of, you didn't broadcast it. No. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the census, of course, erased people mm -hmm. by not having any designation for Native people and forced people to either become white or black yeah. or M, whatever that is. Hmm. And um, it's just been the last couple of censuses that people have been able to choose Native American, Alaskan, uh, Alaskan Eskimo, Hispanic, um, white, black, um, Muslim, you know, a lot of people don't classify themselves as white or black. Right. So um, censuses had to catch up with... Uh, modern um, categories, I guess you could call them. I mean, do you think that some of the country's progress now, I mean, the same as in Canada, is recognizing uh, more of the atrocities that have happened with our indigenous people and moving forward and yeah. making amends? I think there's um, a greater sensitivity and um, acknowledgement and understanding mm -hmm. from um, the society as a, as a whole. And um, uh, all of these um, movements serve to educate the public and make the public more aware of things that have happened. Mm -hmm. So people aren't as uh, ignorant as they might have been generation or two ago. And people have learned that they can be proud of having native heritage, right. whatever other heritage they might have or blends. And I think any of the DNA shows kind of show us that we're all kind of a mixture of a number of different, <laughs> there are very few pure people, very few pure Europeans or pure this or pure that. It's not the way it is. All right. Yeah. Any any questions? Any more questions? Anyone else? Well, Claire, it, it really has been a wealth of information. Thank you so very much for the presentation. And for those of you that are still with us, as with our all of our programs, we've recorded tonight's program. So please, you know. Tell your friends if they weren't able to be with us tonight, they can go on the library's YouTube and find a recording of this. It usually takes a couple days before we have it posted, but um, this is the kind of information we want to share with a lot of people. Yes, thank you so much, Claire. There have been people in the chat thanking you. And um, again, it's been a really wonderful wealth of information and it, and I'm just, all the more curious to find out more. Al, I, I Al. see that Al James yeah. has his hand just, up. Just, yes, Al. Just the final comment, of, because Claire mentioned it, is that there's no more pure. But America, when we were growing up, they always said America is the melting pot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that shouldn't be a surprise then when it comes to that. We're a stew. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. A big pot of stew. <laughs> right. And now more people are seemingly are proud of it, whereas years ago, 
the pride was not there. Um, people wanted to either assimilate more or hide or disguise. Well, because they were discriminated against. Because if, of the if, discrimination. Right. If they if they thought you had a drop of, well, if you had a drop of, you know, whatever, uh, you were discriminated against and suffered. Mm -hmm. So right. right. And I'm sure the indigenous uh, people really, really felt that um, as well as yeah. other people. Mm -hmm. And still do. Now. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, Claire, as our other Claire said, many people thank you. And Mark Gotworth, I think I'm saying your name correctly, has said Wasi Lenape for thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mark. Nice to meet you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Very good. Well, please tune in again. Nice to meet you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. And Thank please you. come back May the 31st. And whatever library you go to, stop in this week and say Happy National Library okay. Week. Okay. We'll appreciate it. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. everyone, for being here. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Thanks.